Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who your faithless disciple Judas sold for a vile sum of money to the Jews who were persecuting you and conspiring against your life. Root out, I beg you, from my heart, all evil love of any creature. Grant that I may never prefer anything to you. May I always show the most perfect charity towards all men, especially those who trouble me. Pardon me, my holy Redeemer, for having so often preferred vain and perishable things to you, and for having, for the sake of vile pleasures, turned myself from you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who ate the Passover with your disciples at Jerusalem, according to the commandment of the law, giving them an example of humility and holy love by kneeling down on the ground and washing their feet, wiping them with a linen cloth. I pray that this your example may penetrate my soul, destroying thoroughly any haughtiness and pride within me. Give me, O Lord, the deepest humility, that I may, without delay, perform the lowest ministry to all men. Give me perfect obedience, that I may, with complete diligence, observe as your commandments whatever your appointed representatives may decide. Give me the most fervent charity, that I may sincerely love all mankind. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who out of your unspeakable love gave us the sacrament of the Eucharist and in it given yourself to us with wondrous liberality so that you might remain with us even bodily unto the end of the world. Grant me, I beg you, O Lord, an earnest longing and enkindle in my innermost soul an intense hunger for this adorable sacrament. Grant that when I go to the table of life I may receive you with chaste affection, complete humility and perfect purity of heart. May my soul so thirst for you now and so languish in your love that I may one day be found suitable to enjoy the delights of your eternal kingdom to the glory everlasting of your name. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were about to leave the world, commanded and comforted with words of unspeakable sweetness your disciples, and most earnestly, com earnestly commended them in prayer to your Father, most plainly showing how tenderly you loved them and us, who were to believe through their word. Grant that my heart may evermore relish your word, and that I may find your words sweeter than honey to my taste. Oh, that the spirit of that burning exhortation may so glide into my heart that I may be wholly transformed into your love. So direct all my ways, O Lord my God, that your holy will may be done in and by me for ever and ever. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who went out with your disciples across the Kedron brook and came into the garden which you knew would be where you would be taken. May I entirely give up my will and always follow and love yours. May I, for your honour and for the salvation of my brothers and sisters, boldly endure any adversity and be willing even to lay down my life if your divine providence should so ordain it. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, as your passion drew nigh, began to be sorrowful and sad, with a heavy heart, and so that by transferring the weakness of all your members to yourself, you might be able to console and strengthen them when they were in their time of fear at the approach of death, by this your own weakness which you had willingly taken upon you. Preserve me, I beg you, both from the immoderate sorrow and from foolish gladness. Grant that the grief which I have thus far endured may be for your glory and for the remission of my sins. Remove mercifully from me all distrust and unnecessary weakness and confirm and establish my soul whole in you. 
Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who fell prostrate on the ground and prayed to your Holy Father, humbly offering your whole self to him, saying, Your will be done. Give me grace in every necessity and trouble to fly to you in prayer and freely to resign and myself give myself up to your will. May I never unduly endeavour to escape from trouble, but receive all things from your hand with a quiet mind, and may I endure everything in meekness of spirit for your love. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise. Oh, 
Reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 8. They arrived in the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, a certain man out of that city, who had had demons for a long time, met him. He wore no clothes and didn't live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, what do I have to do with you, Jesus, you son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. 
For Jesus was commanding the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For the unclean spirit had often seized the man. He was kept under guard and burned with chains and fetters. Breaking the bonds apart, he was driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered into him. They begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. Now there was a herd of many pigs feeding on the mountain, and they begged him that he would allow them to enter into those. And he allowed them. And the demons came out of the man that entered into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the deep the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told the people in the city and in the country. And the people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed and in his right mind, and they were very afraid. Those who saw it told them how he had been possessed by demons, but was healed. All the people of the surrounding country of the Gadarene asked him to depart from them, for they were very much afraid. He entered into the boat and returned. But the man from whom the demons had gone out begged him that he might go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your house and declare what great things God has done for you. He went on his way, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. When Jesus returned, the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Behold, there was a man called Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet, and begged him to come into his house. For he had an only daughter, about twelve years of age, who was dying. But as he went, the multitude pressed against him. A woman who had had a flow of blood for twelve years, who had spent all her life living on physicians and could not be healed by any, came behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, and immediately the flow of her blood stopped. Jesus turned and asked, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitude presses and jostles you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, for I perceived that power has gone from me. When the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and fell down before him, and declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. He said to her, Daughter, cheer up, your faith has made you well, go in peace. While he was still speaking, one from the ruler of the synagogue's house came, saying to him, Your daughter is already dead, don't trouble the teacher. But Jesus, hearing it, answered, Don't be afraid, only believe, and she will be healed. When he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter in except Peter, John, James, and the father and mother of, her ch of the child. All were weeping and mourning her. But he said, Don't weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he sent them all outside, and taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. Her spirit returned, and she rose up immediately. He commanded that something be given to her, to eat. Her parents were amazed, but he commanded them to tell no one what had been done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Two miserable creatures are mentioned in Matthew, in the land of the gathering. No sooner has Jesus come forth on the land than they rush toward him. Human, yet without the mental attributes of humanity, shunned by all, left in a lonely place to rend the air with fearful cries, to 
to clash themselves against stone, wretched beyond the name of wretchedness. One of the two is singled out by Luke and described, and observe the effects on of Jesus' presence. Instantly some long silence chord was touched. Some new sense of the awful misery into which the man had been plunged was awakened. Some conflict between the mind made suddenly active, and the nameless power of darkness was originated. The maniac fell down, and with a loud voice cried out as if the other one were crying through him. What do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. What a wonderful confession, which, however, had been preceded by a word of authority, and which is followed by a kind of confused perception. What is your name? What name had he? What personality? The only word which seemed to describe the situation was the Roman name for a host. My name is Legion, for we are many. Poor Legion! For there is in you a groaning which cannot be uttered, and that groaning unaware to yourself, as the form of the old prayer. Unite my heart to fear your name. Lo, he who knows the mind of the Spirit has heard you, and he has given a new song to your mouth. Henceforth you will say, I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name for evermore. For great is your mercy to me, and you have delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Thus far, all though wonderful, is beautiful and Christ-like. But now comes the strange portion of the narrative. Jesus is described as giving the demons which had laid waste the son of Abraham leave to possess the herd of swine feeding on the mountainside. The consequence of which was that the herd ran violently down the steep slope into the sea and were drowned. Against this destruction, many objections have been brought. It is a stumbling stone for many, a offence even to believers. Even in faith it seems at variance with the merciful nature of our Lord, and the transfer of evil power from the man to the herd of swine, bristles with things that are hard for us to understand. Explanations are offered, some of them ingenious, but all are unsatisfactory. I'm not going to be dwelt on today. It is assumed that we take the evangelist to be a trustworthy guide as to the events which are out of the plane of ordinary life. Somehow, somewhere, the work done is reconcilable with the true nature of things with the mercy and the truth which are all around God's paths. Let us observe two points. To the possessed man himself, there was given a testimony never to be forgotten of the sin and the misery from which the stronger than the strong one had delivered him. The effect on the character, the influence of which some action or course of conduct would have in the establishment of trust in himself or the education of the disciple, was always in the mind of Christ. Now what an evidence, in a form of which one's shattered intellect was not yet fully restored, could understand, was given of the awful waste of spiritual life, the awful force of untrained, unsanctified nature, by the sight of that rush into the sea. Recollect too that according to the correspondence of Scripture, these swine represent the more bestial and corrupt propensities of our nature. Pascal, in one of his most cynical sayings, refers to man as half beast, half devil. There is something of the beast in men, and that what happened that day is the token of what does happen when the lower animal is acted on by the spirits of malignity and darkness when, from some cause operating from without, that which is animal is acted upon by which that which is devilish. Is it not that same violent rushing down the steep place of poor animalized beings, their true life checked and destroyed, witnessed every day?
Do we not constantly see infatuations similar to that portrayed in the herd of swine? In England, more than 120,000 die every year as a result of strong drink. If, has been asked, there is such a destruction of cattle or swine in the country, what attention will be called to it? What a host of remedies and measures with a view to its prevention would be propounded, but no one takes any notice. Undoubtedly, the event in Gadarinia is a sign of what mere carnal appetite, when fed by some exciting cause, brings about. And being so, it is a standing witness for the blessings of his salvation, whose gospel is a new order as well as a new life, who controls what is lawless by the law of liberty, and at whose feet the man from whom devils are departed sits clothed and in his right mind. To all of us there is a sad significance in the behaviour of the people of Gadarinia. The two facts before them were the swine lost and the man gained. Which of the two was the greater? The swine lost. That spoke to them of a fearful power in the man who had landed on their shore. Perhaps their consciences were uneasy. If they were Jews, and some of them must have been, they knew that, for the purpose of gain, they had broken Moses' in law. Why should he continue in their midst, whose glance burnt like an oven? Anyway, instead of remembering what attracted and spoke of healing and the cure of man, they remember only what had caused them loss and the destruction of the swine. Away, they cry, you, holy and terrible one, we don't wish to be disturbed in our way, trouble us no longer. What a fearful prayer! But do not more than the Gadarenes pray it. Are there many not here today whose secret heart protests? Let us alone, O Lord God. Let us make money as best we can. Eat, drink, and be merry. Away with the spiritual, away with church, away with God. Give us our swine and let heaven go. Fearful prayer and fearful answer. God answers, sharp and sudden, on some prayers, and flings the things that we have asked for in our face, a gauntlet with a gift in it. He entered into the boat and returned. There is only one of another spirit in the multitude, he who for a few moments before had cried, What have I to do with you? Now beseech you, like Ruth the old. Entreat me not to leave you, where you go, I will go, and where you dwell, I will dwell. No, he must remain, Christ's missionary and witness to his unbelieving countrymen. Not to luxuriate in him, but to live and work for him, is the call of the redeemed. And he went his way, publishing throughout the whole city the great things that Jesus had done for him. Let us pray. O oh God, for as much as without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless us and keep us from all evil bringing us to everlasting life. Amen.